Good, good morning. Uh, three things as we start. I think uh, just one, please uh, sympathize with me. I have to preach everything in past tense now as if the three folks have just gotten baptized. So I've got that going for me. Uh, two, I thought it was pretty funny. A few of you have already said, including Andy, right before he was baptized, if you weren't baptized before, you got baptized today or re-baptized, and so you may be a Christian all of a sudden now. And three, just one, one point of instruction, I think, for us, even as we were praying, Pastor Jason, right before the service started, as we were making the adjustments, he said, this is good for us. This is good for us who want control. This is good for us who panic when things go wrong. It's good for us because we get to trust in the Lord today, that he is good, he has a purpose for everything that he's doing, and the world is still in order because God is still on his throne. And it's going to be a memorable Sunday today because... We're in, in person for the first time in this way, and how long? We get to worship the Lord together in this way, so it's, it's a great Sunday, and it's, it's great to be with you all today. Also, just want to say thank you to the entire team who transitioned everything within 10 minutes. The band, the, the audio team, video, all of you pitched in. Thank you guys so much for adjusting, and uh, we're looking forward to a great service even still. So let's pray, and we'll come to God's word in a moment that you are Lord, you are creator of all things, you have created us, and you have created us to love you, to know you, to worship you, and even on a day like today, when things don't go as planned, we are so thankful that we are still uh, the, the people of God who are held in your hands. You love us, you saw us before time even began, you called us out as your own, and even as we've just sung, you've not forsaken us, instead you have called us your own. And so we pray that even as we are under your word today, you would speak particularly to us. Remind us afresh of the salvation that we have in Jesus Christ. Soften our hearts to believe you if we have not believed you ever. We pray that those of us who have wandered away from you would return again to you today. Your word has the power to do all of this and more, and we are especially thankful for Colleen, for Caitlin, for Andy, for the work that you have done in their hearts and lives in these years to call them to your own. Make this especially special for them and their families, we pray. It's in Christ's name, amen. Friends, today as we come to God's word and as we've just witnessed baptism, it's a really special day for us, not just because we saw a sacrament that is practiced in the church, but because today is one of those days where you get to visibly see God at work. It's not every day that you tangibly get to see that God is at work in the world. What do I mean by that? You know, there are moments in, in life, whether you're a Christian or not, where you wonder, is God actually active in the world? Is he doing anything? Does he care about us? Perhaps especially for us in these past months, 18 months or so, wondering, is God near? Does he provide hope for us in hopelessness? And today we got to witness through the lives and witness of three individuals, that the answer to that question, all of those questions, is a resounding yes. That God is still at work. He is still changing lives. He is still rescuing people from lives that could have headed for ruin and damnation. He is still changing hearts, changing the trajectory of people's lives all over the world. And we got to see three examples of that today. And this morning... Colleen, Caitlin, and Andy, we got to see that the real God of the Bible was actively and is actively at work in your life. As you recounted to us how you came to know Jesus, we got to see that a dead heart came to life by a God who infused his grace and power into your soul. And for that, we can thank the Lord. That he actually, Colleen, Caitlin, and Andy sought you out by name. As Ephesians reminds us, that before the foundations of the world were laid, that he, he thought about you, he chose you, that you were not forsaken, that you actually had a home in God. You three today are a witness that God is still active in the world today and even here at Seven Mile Road in Philadelphia. So be encouraged, Seven Mile Road, the Lord is at work. As we have witnessed uh, these three enter the waters of baptism, we want to ask the question now, what is baptism? It's a chance for you three to consider again what you just participated in, but it's also a chance for all of us to consider what do those waters represent? 
what is it pointing to? If you've been a part of Seven Mile Road for any point in time, or if you've been a part of the Christian church, you may have expl- heard baptism explained like this, that it's an outward expression of an inward reality, that baptism is this outward expression of an inward reality, right? Sort of like if you were to drive down the highway and see a sign, it's pointing to a destination, right? If you were to drive down on a highway in in Philadelphia, you might see a sign that says two miles to the art museum. The, The sign itself isn't the thing. It's pointing to something. It's signifying something else. Or or perhaps if you are married and you have a wedding ring, it would be silly for me to say that this wedding ring is my marriage. It's not my marriage, but it's pointing to something very significant, and that is my marriage. And so in a significant way, and in a parallel type of way, baptism is pointing to something that's real in your heart. And so baptism symbolizes that something has happened in the lives of those who have gone into the water and come out, namely that God has supernaturally saved a person through the work of Jesus Christ and that he has united them to himself and to his church. And that should blow your mind, that that supernatural work has actually happened. Christ has saved, united a person to himself and to other people in the church. The waters of baptism do not save a person. They don't have that power, especially not Philadelphia tap water does not have that power. Rather, the waters of baptism instead shows that a person has already been saved. The waters don't save you. The waters show that you have been saved. And so the passage that we are in today is in Romans chapter 6. If you have a Bible, there might be a, a Bible in the seats underneath you, or you can grab it on your phone on an app. Romans chapter 6 Verses 3 to 11 is going to be our passage today. And we're going to quickly go through this this short passage. In verse 3 of Romans chapter 6, it says, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death. As you saw, Colleen, Caitlin, and Andy being put down into the water. That, that symbolic act, even as you saw with your own eyes, there, there was a, a going down into the water, almost symbolizing a burial into death. Right? You get that visual in your head. And so we ask, what is it that dies in baptism? If there's a, if there's a burial, a death happening, what is it that dies in baptism? Paul tells us in verse 6, we know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. And so what dies in baptism? Us. We die in baptism. What the Bible calls the old man, the old self. And this old man, you and I know him. You and I know her. These men and women of old were full of sin. We, we, in fact, the Bible says, were enslaved to sin, shackled by sin, unable to shake its chains, born into sin, motivated by sin, enticed by sin, living only for self-gratification and self-indulgence and self-exaltation and selfish ambitions. Sin, dear friends, was the only defining characteristic of our lives, our pursuit of self, our pursuit of sin. That's who we were, the old self. And in the waters of baptism, it is showing us that all of that dies. Everything that is sinful, everything that that would draw us away from God and towards that which is evil, dies. That those things that would ruin us cause us misery, depression, anger, those kinds of things, dies actually in, this, in, in what baptism represents. As one pastor has written, God brings men and women in deep waters not to drown them, but to cleanse them. And so when you witness what happens in baptism, it looks like death, but it's actually a cleansing that is happening, a cleansing of the soul a cleansing of all that would, uh, would cause us to walk away from that which is good, namely God. 
Or as another pastor, Charles Spurgeon, has written, I thought, as he thought of his own baptism, I thought that I could have leaped from earth to heaven in one spring when I first saw my sins drowned in the Redeemer's blood. To look back over the waters, if, if you could see spiritually with your visible eyes, and if, if your sins were laid in that water, how polluted they would be. And then to see all of that cleansed, you cleansed by the Redeemer's blood. Oh, you would be able to leap from earth to heaven itself. That's how wonderful the work of baptism is representing what happens in your life. The cleansing power that these waters represent is the cleansing of all of your sins. Your, your past sins, your, your present sins, and sins that you don't even know you're going to commit. That's the power of the work of God in your life. It is death to the power of sin over you. Seven Mile Road, for all of us, would you consider what is your most vilest sin? What is the thing that causes you most guilt and most shame? What is the thing that you think, if I did that or if I, I have done that or if I do do that, that would make me too far gone from the grace of God? What is that sin in your life? What is that temptation in your life? Jesus cleanses you of all of it. Jesus saves you from your worst shame, your worst sin. Even after this day of baptism, as you and I in our mortal bodies struggle to fight sin, remember that you are dead to sin. As you and I go back to the things that we know will ruin us, remember, friends, that you are dead to sin. It has no power over you. It, it, Jesus died so that you would be saved from your sins. You are dead to sin. It, sin doesn't define you. It doesn't have power over you. You are now a new creation in Jesus Christ. And so this day, run from the sin that you might be in today. It leads only to death. In fact, and hear this, so powerful is the work of Christ to cleanse you from your sins. So significant is your death to sin that your future death, your future physical death, will not have the same effect on you that it would have if you did not put your faith in Jesus Christ. Would you hear that? So significant, so powerful is the work of Christ to cleanse you from your sins that your future physical death will not have the same effect on you as if it did if you didn't trust in Jesus Christ. I said this a few weeks ago, and I'll say it again today. The most horrific thing that you could experience in life is not your death. The most horrific experience that you and I could ever experience is to die without Jesus. Death is not our worst enemy. In fact, death without Jesus actually is the worst thing that you and I could ever face on the other side of this earth. Without Christ cleansing us from our sins, being plunged and dying with Christ. But today, we celebrate the absolute stunning reality that today is the death of sin's dominion over the saved sinner. Today is the dominion that Christ has over every single one of your sins and death itself. It's the death of condemnation, the death of hopelessness, and the death of eternal homelessness. There is amazing realities today that we get to celebrate in what baptism represents. But thanks be to God, because death, isn't, death to sin isn't the reality for us in this world. Right? There's a reality beyond this world that we're going to be with Christ, we're going to resurrect with him, and there's, there's a future awaiting those who put their faith in Christ. But we actually don't have to wait until then to live in the reality of what Christ has done in our lives. Because we don't have to wait for our physical death to happen because in verse 4, Paul says, just while we have been baptized into death, just as Christ was raised from the dead, we too might walk in newness of life. So we're dead to sin, and we will rise with him again. But as we come out of those waters, what that represents is that we actually come into new life. You're not just buried with your sin, in your sin. You're not, your sin's not just buried in the grave. But when you come up, 
You are coming up to newness of life. There's actually life that you have to look forward to, physical, earthly life in this world as a result of the reality of Christ's work in your life. In baptism, you don't stay under the waters of baptism. You don't just stay under that watery grave. No, you come up out of the water, and out of this death comes new life. A life that is no longer defined by self. Consider the world that we live in, friends. We live in a world that urges us to pursue our own pleasure, our own happiness, our own, whatever our mind says is true of the world and of us, to follow that path. The culture all around us tells us that we find happiness when we follow our own path, that when we define reality by our own minds. But hear this today, whatever your age, whether you're in middle school, high school, older, have been a Christian for years, don't buy the lie. Don't buy the lie that your happiness, your joy, reality is is figured out and determined by what you say it is, because it's not true. Sometimes it's helpful for even people that might be outside of the Christian world to speak to us about this. Many of you know Jim Carrey, the actor, the comedian, hugely successful. He's famous for having said this. I wish that everybody could get rich and famous and do everything that they ever dreamed of doing so that they can see that it is not the answer. To have everything, and Jim Carrey does, that you could ever possibly want, every pleasure, every treasure, every pursuit, every success, every position, every person, lauding at you and praising you to only realize that it still is not enough to answer the plaguing question that all of us have in our souls, seeking for something fulfilling to to give us joy and lasting happiness. How often, friends, do we search for pleasures and for people and for positions for our joy to be content in? Brothers and sisters, don't buy the lie. For lasting joy and satisfaction in life only comes when you put to death self and you put to death everything of your ambitions and you come alive to God. Joy, life, reality only happens when you die to yourself and when you come alive to God. Death to self, alive to God. And when you do that, it changes everything about your life. High school students, I know it doesn't seem like it when everything around you, friends, perhaps what you're you're hearing on media as you go off to college, I know there's a lot of things that glitter in the world. Don't buy the lie. Because life and truth only comes to you when you trust in God and come alive to Him. That's where joy is found. And that's a beautiful reality that we hope for you as well. Caitlin, it's been such a joy witnessing that in your life. And we hope for all the kids today, even hearing these words, would come to faith in Jesus Christ and to believe that Jesus really is the way, the truth, and the life, and that there's joy to be found there. I've shared the story of St. Augustine to you. He's, been, he's a church, early church father, an influencer in the Christian faith. He was influential in my own coming to Jesus, and I've shared this story with you before, before knowing Jesus, Augustine's life was defined by self and by sin. One day after his conversion and baptism, as Augustine was walking around the a road, a, a woman from a balcony shouted out at Augustine and said, Augustine, look, it is I. And this woman is someone that Augustine had a sinful relationship with. And so Augustine hears this woman shout from the balcony and say, Augustine, it is I. Augustine kept walking down the road. The woman shouts again, Augustine, it is I from the balcony. Augustine continued without hesitation and keeps walking. A third and final time, the woman shouts from the balcony, Augustine, Augustine, it is I. And Augustine finally turns to the woman in the balcony and he says, I know, but it is not I. I am different. The old has gone away. The new has come. 
I know that it's you, but it's not me. The, I, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Listen, when you come to faith in Jesus Christ, the old you is gone, and everything about you changes. You have a new hope. You have a new future. You have a new reality. You have a new father. You have a new family, brothers and sisters in Christ. There is so much good that the work of Christ has for you. And in baptism, what you see is the death of self at coming alive to God on the other side. And that is a beautiful thing. Colleen, Caitlin, and Andy, one of the most amazing things about baptism is that Jesus himself sat once where you sat as you awaited baptism. He stood where you stood as you awaited baptism. He awaited himself, would you hear, to be baptized himself. Not because he was full of sin, not because Jesus had anything to rid in himself that was sinful and, and patterned after this world, but because he himself would symbolize in the waters of baptism what he came to do for you. Consider on the banks of the Jordan are all kinds of people seated, standing, all kinds of people awaiting to be baptized with Jesus. There are liars and thieves, abusers, cheaters, the prideful, the sexually immoral, the racist, hypocrites, people just like you and me. And then there's Jesus. All kinds of people, all shapes and sizes, all kinds of sins on their own. And there Jesus sits among sinners as the one who is supposed to save them from their sins. And what a beautiful picture that is because he came to sit with sinners. He came to walk alongside them to stand with them, but not only does he do that, he actually takes their place. Not just in the line to the, to the baptism that John was performing, but in the line for their punishment to sins. And hear, hear this, baptism actually was symbolizing, the baptism of Jesus was symbolizing a death, an impending death for Jesus. It wasn't just in a tank or in a river, but there was a real burial coming. There was a real drowning, a real being put into the earth, and a real rising from death that accomplishes your salvation, friends. Whether you were baptized today or were baptized in the past, would you stop for a moment and consider the fact that Jesus came to this world to save you from your sins? Let the baptism that you witnessed today allow you to go back to that moment where Jesus saved you. Whenever that was, if it was over a period of time, go back and remember your baptism. What happened on that day? Much like someone would look at their wedding ring and remember their vows and what they were pledged to in that moment. Would you go back and remember the waters of your baptism and the God who saved you? That God walked among you and me, sinners and fools, that he lived a perfect life that you could never live, that he bore your sins on the cross that you could never shake, that he not, did not count you out, that he did not forsake you, that he chose to love you and make you. Consider, who are you? Who am I? That God would be mindful of us to come down and that we would benefit from his death. If you are here and have never been baptized before, if you are witnessing the baptism of these three and perhaps there's a, a, a slight nudge in your heart to want that for, for yourself, to know Jesus yourself, there's good news for you because Jesus saves. Jesus saves the most unlikely of us. Jesus saves those who have considered religion but then walked away from it for 10 years plus. Jesus saves those who are embarrassed of their sins would never find themselves in a church building like this today. Jesus saves. He saves all of us, not because we're good, not because we have good efforts in finding him and proving ourselves to him, but because of Jesus Christ and his work for us. There is a Savior, and his name is Jesus. And so today, Colleen, uh, Colleen, Caitlin, and Andy, we are so happy for you. We are so thrilled in what you have publicly displayed to us through your baptism and we pray that this day would be one that you will look back onto. We know that you'll remember it, but that most of all, you would remember the reality that Christ came into this world 
died for you, you identify with that death. He has risen for you, and you will raise, be raised again with him on that last day. And you have newness of life today. Let's pray together. Our Father, we are so thankful that you write stories that we could never write on our own. You, you craft our lives in a way that through seasons of suffering and sin and wandering, through seasons of joy and bright shining skies, in all of it, you cause us to come alive to you when we were so far away from you. You cause the very small details of our lives to somehow work together so that you might find us and so that we might respond in faith to you. We thank you that you've done those, that work in these three today. We pray that for all of us who have been baptized in Christ, that we would again rejoice in the fact that we are made a part of Christ, united with him, a part of the family of God. Help us even now to rejoice in that reality and to put all of our faith in you again. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen.